We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. So up until this point, we've been looking at Jesus. We've been looking at... Uh, I'm just going to read that bit again. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. This is quite a guy, isn't it? It's quite a guy. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. Wow. This is an awesome being. This can only go well. This If God himself turns up in human form, he's going to just have power coming out of every pore in his being. He's going to flatten mountains. He's going to destroy armies. He's going to shake the world. That's the way gods work, isn't it? That's what gods do. When God turns up, They just exert their power and their influence and they smite everything, okay? And then we come to this next section. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. We're so familiar with this, this is the end of the story. We look everywhere. On every church building, there's a cross. People have crosses around their necks. They have this image of the cross. It's such a normal thing for us as being a, the, the central point of Christianity, central point of, the, of what Jesus did, that it, we miss often what's really going on, what, really, what a scandal it was. And my hope this morning is that you understand how abominably scandalous it is that this thing happened and that this, you can have a part of it and it has an influence on your life from now on. Because the act of crucifixion was horrific. So horrific that m- most ancient sources don't have a lot about it. It doesn't really feature in any part of many stories. In fact, the biggest reference we've got to crucifixion occur in four stories, and you have them in your Bibles. Almost no other places 
in ancient literature is crucifixion talked about. And yet, in our creed, this is the central point of the gospel. So much that we've gone from his birth, skip out all those miracles, feeding the 5,000, healing the sick, casting out demons, all those things, psh, nothing about that. We go straight to death and death on a cross. And the point they were making in the Nicene Creed when they say, for our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Does anybody know who the mayor of Worthing is? We have a show of hands. How many people could name the mayor of Worthing? <laughs> Somebody does. Well, well done. We've got one. One person knows the current mayor of Worthing. And yet, all of you know a minor the name of a minor government official in Israel 2,000 years ago. The point is, the saying in the creed is, guys, this actually happened. It happened in a real place, in a real time. It was a, a real man, a chap called Pontius Pilate, who he, who killed, delivered onto a cross, this glorious God, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, and a man called Pontius Pilate had him strung on a cross and killed. That actually happened. Crucifixion was reserved for the nobodies, and its message was, you are, this figure, this body hanging on this cross is a complete and utter nobody. He is, his shame is complete and utter. We don't do this to citizens, we don't do this to anybody of high standing or noble, nobleness. He's hanging there naked on a cross. And you can pass by and you can spit at him. You can pass by and you know that this guy has absolutely no value at all. The process of crucifixion was to beat them up within an inch of their lives. Then make them carry the cross part of the, of, of the cross, and then they nailed him in. Then they hung it up. And then wait for him to die, slowly. Painfully, because every single breath has to be fought for. Because the way you're hung up is suffocating you. And it's suffocation that causes death in the end. Because you give up the possibility of grabbing another breath. And at that point, the birds start pecking on you and feeding you. The flies are all around you because your blood is tasty for them. It is horrific. The sound effects are good, aren't they? <laughs> you have to realize how deep God went in crucifixion. Because this was not the end of the story that they were expecting. This was not what anybody in any religion of that time would have expected God to do. Like I said, God's turn up and they wipe out your enemies. They deliver you. That's certainly what Israel was expecting. And when um, Paul wrote to the, crucif wrote to the Corinthians, um, he said, I delivered to you as first of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. What does that mean? 
What does it mean that he died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures? Even at this stage, in the first century, they're struggling with understanding that this would be the end of the story, that crucifixion would be this week. Guys, I know next week we're preaching on the resurrection. Okay. And we know that the crucifixion wasn't the end of Jesus' story. It wasn't how it, was, how it all finished up. But the crucifixion, the shame, the abject shame of it, surely there was another way. Surely there was another way that God could deal with our sin. It's falling off my ears. No God and no hero could ever be crucified. And the expectation of Israel was that God, when he turned up, was going to deal with the oppressors, deal with, the, deal with the, um, those who had uh, put them in shame. And he was going to uh, deliver them from their sins by delivering them from their enemies. That was how the story was going to work out. And yet, there we have God on a cross. They looked at him and they said, this is the end of the story. We can spiritualize it. We can think, oh my goodness, you know, maybe this is a, just a bad, <coughs> God is identifying with us in our, in, in our weakness and stuff like that. But you want to understand, for them, it's, it feels like everything has gone utterly and utterly wrong. Utterly and totally wrong. But, why did Jesus have to die? Why was it necessary for him to die? In Philippians it says, I'm going to find that passage. I had it turned to there. Bear with me. Bear with me. Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As I said, crucifixion was for slaves. It was for nobodies. It was a declaration that this man is a nobody. Why did Jesus have to go to that point? It's because... He had to suck, draw our sin into, our, into himself. He had to go to the utmost for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He was pure and holy and true. He was the true man. And on that cross, the punishment that was coming to all of us, he draws into himself. I want you to picture it. I want you to picture Jesus hanging there on the cross. I want you to understand that that sin, that sin has caused him to be there. The only way that your sin could be dealt with was for him to do that. For the justice of God to be poured out on one man at one point in history.
And often we think of our sin as being quite mild, really. We don't think of ourselves as being really that bad. Is it necessary for us to suffer for our sins? What is sin anyway? What does it, what does it matter if I have an extra cream cake? As people think of sin. I'd like to tell you a little story to understand how ex- extreme the forgiveness is. Because sometimes we think, well, surely God could have just, just forgiven us. Would it, was it necessary to go to the cross for God to forgive? Could he not just say, oh, it's no bad. It's not a bad thing, really. We're just Let's just cover it over. Let's wipe it out. You've got to understand that really the issue is that the cross deals with every single sin, not just your extra cream cake. I'll tell you the story of Joseph Fritzl. On the 28th of August, 1984, after his daughter Elizabeth turned 18, Joseph Fritzl lured her into the basement of the family home, saying that he needed help carrying a door. In reality... Fritzl had been converting the basement into a makeshift prison chamber. The door was the last thing he needed to seal it. And after Elizabeth held the door in place while Fritzl fitted it into the frame, he held an ether-soaked towel on her face until she was unconscious, then threw her into the chamber. Over the next 24 years, Fritzl visited Elizabeth in the hidden chamber almost every day a minimum of three times a week, bringing food and other supplies and repeatedly raping her. Is forgiveness possible for that? Is it possible that Joseph Fritzl could have that sin covered? Is it possible for God to say, you can have that wiped away, you can have that sin removed from the record? Is it possible for God to say to Joseph Fritzl, welcome, you can be included? I think if we had a show of hands here, there might be a fair debate about that. And yet we've got to understand that the the death of Jesus on the cross was sufficient to deal with that sin. It's a scandal. It's a complete and utter scandal. It's a scandal that God would allow that sort of sin to be wiped out. But the problem is, for you and I, with our little sins, I joke about the cream cakes, because cream cakes are fine, guys. (laughs) Honest. Let's lighten this a little. But the problem is, is that sin, Fritzl's sin, the seeds of that sin exist in each one of us. He's just allowed it to, f- to bear an incredible amount of fruit. But sin inhabits and failing inhabits every single one of us. There are no good people and bad people. In this world, we'd love to say, well, those are the bad guys, and these are the good guys. You watch any Hollywood film, and they're dividing up the good guys from the bad guys. And yet, the line between good and evil, as Solzhenitsyn said, runs runs through the heart of every man. And who is prepared to give up a part of his own heart? Our sin, it's our sin that held him there. It was necessary for God to go to the cross for justice to be done. God could not just overlook it. He couldn't overlook Fritzl's sin. He couldn't just say, well, that's that's okay. Because the rest of us would rise up in anger about that, wouldn't we? 
Say, it can't be that God could just ignore that. What sort of a universe are we living in? We have a sense of justice within us that requires this to be dealt with. There's not a general amnesty going on here. That only serves the worst of us. We want God to be just. We want him to be true. We want him to deal with sin. We want him to, to, to protect the, the weak and vulnerable, and we want him to wipe out those who are oppressing and murdering and all that sort of stuff. We want justice to be done. And how does justice get done? It gets done on the cross. And the scandal is that the Son of God takes it on himself. People often said that there was a fair amount of debate a few years ago about that the, the, the father pours out his wrath upon the son. There was a kind of argument about being a form of cosmic child abuse. Why would God do that? We, we, we know what it is to be a loving father. We know what it is not to, not to pour out our anger on our children. Surely this God, who you say is a good God, how can he do that to his own son? Well, you've got to understand this is God. This is how the Trinity works. God himself is taking on our sin in himself on that cross. And as he hangs there on the cross, bleeding, gasping for breath, he is drawing into himself every single one of your sins. Every single one of the things that you have done wrong, which are a fruit, those things that you do, are the fruit of a, of a personal weakness and a personal twistedness in your life that leads you into it. It's not these little things you do. It's the fact that you know that inside you, you are not straight. You are not the way you were designed to be. You are not reflecting the glory of God. You find worship hard. You find being good hard. We know this from our children. When they grow up, they, they don't... That we don't have to teach them to be naughty, do we? It comes absolutely naturally to them. We have to teach them to be good. We have to teach them to live and share their toys and to be nice to people, not pull their hair and stuff like that. There's something wrong with us, and God is setting it straight. And in himself on the cross, he's drawing that sting, that death, that pain into himself. He's drawing in that girl who's been abused and molested on a housing estate somewhere. He's drawing in that slave who's working for nothing with no hope of ever getting out. He's drawing in that old person sitting alone, friendless, familyless, isolated, waiting for death. He's drawing in that soldier who's killing and murdering He's drawing in every painful, horrific thing over thousands of years. He's sucking it all into his body on the cross. Dealing with it. Finally, taking separation from God. My God my God, why have you forsaken me? This man, Jesus, hanging there, feeling the pain. He's not, he's, not, he's not somehow in some sort of other body kind of thing. He's feeling that extreme pain on the cross, and he's drawing it into himself so that you can be set free, so that you can live as you were meant to live, as an image bearer of the living God. That 
Brothers and sisters, that is what the cross is about. It's your sin that holds him there. He who knew sin, no sin, became sin for us. He suffered death and was buried. He takes death into himself. This is the living God. You've got to understand how incredibly, how incredibly catastrophic that is. That the living God should die. And yet, as we'll find out next week, by the power of an indestructible life, he comes through death and out the other side. Yeah.